my darling girls, did we really do well? We grew you up to be straight and strong, to do your best to know right from wrong. But we grew you in this awful world, a world that's hard and tough for girls. And part of your strength was to take it, to take it and make it okay. But it's not okay, my darling girls, in this fucked up, muddled up, mixed up world. Thanks for joining us on this pre-Easter weekend. As you know, we are object. We object to pornography, prostitution, strip clubs, surrogacy and transgenderism all at once because until those five systems are dismantled, then women will still be victims of violence from men all the time. Great to see someone coming in from Germany there. Um, a mystery. has have had a mystery here in the UK. You can see this lovely purple, green and white blanket behind me. There's clearly a secret craftivist at work. We don't know who it was, but if you're in the webinar, please make yourselves known. We've made good use of it. It's been put on the Mary Wollstonecraft ridiculous nude statue because clearly Mary needs to be kept warm. Why they didn't clothe her, we don't know. And we have plans for it to be involved in more feminist activism very soon. So whoever was the secret craftivist, thank you very much. And um, much appreciated. We'd love to know who you are so that we can thank you. We'll introduce Maria McLachlan, who's here with us today. A lot of you will know Maria. Maria McLachlan was beaten and had her camera smashed by three men at Speaker's Corner in September 2017. It was covered extensively by the press. She naturally reported the assault, to, um, but only one of her three assailants, known as Tara Wolfe, was ever caught and brought to trial. Police investigations found extensive video footage of the incident, which led to Wolf being convicted and fined a mere £150. As if being assaulted for no reason wasn't enough, controversially at the trial, and we were in court to see this, Maria was instructed by the judge without any notice or reason to refer to her attacker as she, since Wolf was dressed in a skirt that day although he had presented and dressed as a male when he attacked her. This was the day that we feminists discovered that transgender policy capture extended even to rewriting the judge's bench book, which tells them how to behave in court in accordance with trans activist wishes. Even worse, Maria was denied compensation because she'd been, and I'm quoting here, unhelpfully present on the day and was filming Oh, don't be unhelpful, women. Don't be unhelpful. It's the worst thing you can do. It goes against you. Did the judge not realise that without people filming, there would have been no evidence and thus no conviction? He must have believed in the tiresome stereotype that any woman present anywhere must be helpful to everyone else. But he failed to apply that stereotype to Wolf. Funny that. So, We'll allow you to have an hour off from being helpful now in this webinar. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Very important not to be helpful all the time because we need to be very helpful to ourselves and to each other. So on the court, on the day of the trial, we were there and we were shocked, shocked at the judge's demand, which gave Maria a difficult choice between lying. Um, and we all know the concept now of your own personal truth. Maria's truth was very much the same as mine. So she had to choose between lying and defying the judge. This hampered her freedom of expression and her ability to tell the truth right at the moment when, speaking in a court of law and under oath, she most needed to be clear and accurate. We all watched her struggle to comply and the judge's harsh criticism of her occasional accidental reference to him instead of her. Of course, since then, we've had Kate Scotto's case to prove that misgendering isn't actually illegal, although it may be seen as unhelpful. Maria went on, I think if she wasn't radical before, she certainly was radical after this experience. She went on to write her wonderful blog, Peak Trans, regularly gathering together and commenting on the fight back against trans ideology. Do please subscribe if you want to be informed and up to date. Last year, Maria also started a YouTube channel, which has been very well received, where she, in the great tradition of Magdalene Burns, argues her case on the transgender matter. So Maria, welcome to our webinar.
Thank you. Did I get it right about what happened to you? Yes, she did. Yeah, it was about right. Um, How did you feel that horrible day in court? Well, there were two days in court and actually the second day when I was watching from the public gallery was much worse for me than the first day you've just described. I felt okay after giving my testimony, testimony in spite of being humiliated by the judge, yeah, yeah. Um, which as you know, it was while I was having to watch a video of myself being assaulted having to relive the experience um, in front of a you know, courtroom full of people that the judge interrupted me and asked me what my problem was because I'd kept calling him him. Yeah. And um, he then said that the court had as agreed as a matter of courtesy to treat the defendant as a woman and I might like to do the same. Yes. Uh, I couldn't believe how crass he was and yes. as you know I said something like that he's male and that's how I'm used to thinking of him yes. and I did feel terrible at that moment I remember thinking oh god you know the judge is on Wolf's side he's got no empathy for me and I told myself I just have to you know not let him get to me and to stay strong yeah, uh, part, be, yeah. sorry part of me knew um, even then that the judge had not done the trans cause any favours. He did indeed peak trans many, many more people. Yeah. So the second day, however, when I watched four defence witnesses lie under oath, yeah. and even though most of their testimony had been demolished very competently by the prosecution, um, shown to be lies by the available footage uh, for that part of their concocted story for which there was no evidence one way or the other which was me supposedly going around abusing them and filming them at close range when I was asked not to which funnily enough not a single one of them had caught any footage of because it hadn't <laughs> happened um, but they'd concocted this story and the judge chose to believe them mm. um, so they believed people he believed people who were proven liars not a single yes. word of my testimony had been undermined in any way they couldn't this, is, what, this, is, what, this is like a second true. level isn't it they have been shown to be lying all of them they couldn't have all accidentally got it wrong and so much in in the opposite of the video evidence given that there were lots of people filming and so he didn't take that into account. So he was impartial in several, he was partial in several ways. Mm. He was making you talk about somebody in a, in a way that's not your experience. He was um, taking the word of known liars, proven liars, proven there in court under his nose, above what you said, even though you, what you said was supported by the video. And we're coming on to the compensation aspect in a minute, aren't we? So mm. take us on to that. Well, it was in his summing up, he said, um, the, I remember him saying, the witnesses were sincere. And he said that stuff about me having been asked several times not to film. It had not happened. Nobody had objected to being filmed. Um, and if they had objected, all they had to do was walk away. You know, they had stood there um, to provoke us and harass us and drown out our voices. So I started filming them in a place in London, which is famous for yeah. public speaking. And as the police said to me, they are entitled to protest and you're perfectly entitled to film them. So nobody was doing anything wrong in the legal sense until um, Wolf came up and uh, uh, slapped me, slapped a camera first of all and then it was a bit of a pile on. Um, so in the summing up he said the witnesses were sincere and then there was the matter of compensation which he said he wasn't going to award because of my unhelpful presence and also that I'd taken the instruction to refer to him with a feminine pronoun in bad grace. 
Now, I wasn't bothered about this compensation. Um, it wouldn't have been very much. I don't think the guy had very much. I'd actually been put a bit of pressure to apply for it from the police. Otherwise, I just wouldn't have bothered. But it just gave, you know, the public, the press and um, the trans cult enemy um, uh, ammunition against me. They never stopped going on about it. And I did feel really, really awful after that second day of the trial. I felt that the worst criminal in that case was in fact District Judge Kenneth Grant. And what he put me through made me more determined than ever to fight back harder than ever. Yeah, and as you've carried on doing, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Did it, did it, obviously you must have been quite traumatized at the time. Did that wear off yeah. over time or does that come back to you at times? It lasted certainly up to the end of the year when I sought help for it. it was di I was diagnosed with PTSD and I had to stress it wasn't actually the assault that I could have got over that very quickly um, yeah. if it wasn't for the kind of thousands and thousands of horrible, threatening, nasty remarks and the false narratives that um, were being spread about what happened. If they behaved like decent people and just said, oh, you know, he's a bad lot, nothing to do with that, condemn violence, you know, this he doesn't represent, if they behave like that, but instead they try to blame me for the whole thing. And that did make me angry and I couldn't shake it off. And I eventually got um, diagnosed for PTSD and referred for therapy, which um, ultimately did not help very much. Um, but I'm a lot better now. I'm wondering if the recent murder of Sarah Everard and the demonstrations by groups including Sisters Uncut um, have brought up a few memories for you. Yeah, it was certainly hard. I, I blogged about this because oh, it just makes me sick. Uh, these are a bunch of weirdos, sisters unhinged, supposedly <laughs> formed in opposition to government cuts to domestic violence services. Uh, their claim is that they fight alongside all victims of violence, um, sexual violence, gendered violence, state violence. Well, that's a lie because they mobilise support for my violent male assailant. And they did that by the most spectacular um, Davo, is it called? Deny, attack and reverse First victim and offender. offender. Yeah. So poor Tara Wolf, a 26 year old man who has publicly expressed his hatred of women and threatened violence several times on social media. In their view, He's a poor young trans girl who was being doxxed and harassed by turfs and the cops. On the notice they produced to garner support for him at the trial, they actually said attacks on trans lives will not be tolerated. I mean, it's- There haven't been any attacks on trans lives. No, it's mind blowing actually. fantasy. Yeah. And I don't understand the mentality. And of course they won't explain it. They are incapable of explaining the blatant contradictions in their professed well, or position. Or you could say they, they refuse to account for their, the um, contradictions in how they present themselves. Hmm. Um, so I, I've heard them described as a feminist group. Um, yeah, they, they call themselves the feminist group. For why, I do not know. Um, then of are course, we, are they better described as a trans activist group? Absolutely, a men's rights activist group. I mean, we've learnt, those of us who didn't know before, since they hijacked Sarah's vigil, they, they support men who sexually assault little girls if those men claim to be women and they want to abolish prisons. So what do they want to do with the man who murdered Sarah and every other murderer and rapists? I absolutely, <laughs> doesn't compute, you know, I couldn't absolutely despise not. them more. So absolutely no illusions there. Sisters Uncut are a men's rights group, not a women's rights group. Right. Now, as someone's rightly put in the chat. Yeah, we've got to point out, we're, we're all on a level here, we can all be six foot tall, but actually this guy is about six foot tall. I remember seeing him in the court, he's huge. And you, Maria, are about mm. five foot four, I'm guessing. Mm. He's, you're, you're a woman in your 60s, you're fit and well and strong, no one's saying you're not, but 
he's a young, fit male. We all know now, since we've had to explore the sports um, stuff, just how much advantage it gives you. And there were three of them. There were three of them. And there was you. I'm not going to say little Maria, because you'll probably hit me over the screen if I do. But there is a big discrepancy in the size and strength of the people involved in this um, rencontre, shall we say. And it was horrendous. And Sisters Uncut should really, you know, please do not give them any support. They've, made, they've raised lots of money from the back of the... Um, Sarah Everard hijack and I must say it's, it's good to see the um the mother of those two black young women who were murdered in a park in London coming mm. forward and being given a bit of attention because she must have felt terrible you know all mm. she thought about the comeback from that was that police had taken selfies oh, of bodies horrible waters that's my and, local um, police force. nobody even bothered looking for them for a few days and it's horrendous the discrepancy in the way they were treated so mm. Do not believe in sisters uncut. And we have to move on, don't they, when dreadful things happen to us. And as you say, you've peaked trans loads of people. Judge Kenneth Grant peaked trans loads of people. Um, and actually, sometimes when I get discouraged about this thing, I have to stop and I say, do you know, the trans activists are busy peak transing lots of people. Um, we're all, the rest of us are up, are up, who are on the right side of history, it's sensible dawn eventually, but hasn't dawned yet. Let's backtrack a little bit, Maria. Uh, let me just go back into your earlier life. Um, I first met you as a humanist. How did you come to be a humanist and a feminist? Or maybe it was the other way around, a feminist and a humanist, you tell me. Well, it may be around the same time. Uh, as far as being a humanist is concerned, I can remember the first time I heard the word from my dad when I was about 15 and we were watching telly. It was probably the God slot on a Sunday. Now I had stopped believing in God when I was about 12 or 13, um, but we were watching this discussion and there were people representing each of the major world views and a humanist. And I asked my dad, what's that? And he explained what it meant and gave me to understand that he was a humanist himself, if he was anything at all. I knew he was, he did not like religion. Um, and so I decided instantly that I was one too. So that's how I thought of myself. I didn't join the British Humanist Association till a lot later, in fact, just after my dad died, um, must be 92. And that was, he'd had a really awful um, funeral with a, one of those vicars that can't even be bothered to get people's names right and soon after that I was happened to be reading I didn't know about funeral humanist funerals at the time but I read an article in the Guardian I think it was Barbara Smoker and I learned about humanist funerals and I'm thinking oh what a shame you know we could have had one for dad so I joined the British Humanist Association then mostly with a mind to supporting that particular part of their work, but I agreed with all their other policies too. And I was quite a passive member for about 10 years. And then I got a full-time job there as a developmental officer in charge of the ceremonies network. And um, I, I could only stay there a couple of years, um, eventually had to resign to look after my dying mother and after some years, I did her funeral. And then it was some years after that, I went back and became a celebrant myself. And that of course was how we met because we were both celebrants. Yeah. Then. So did, was the feminism a later addition to the humanism or was it part of it? I would say it was probably a bit earlier because um, growing up as a, child in the 60s, young woman in the 70s and 80s, I was uh, very aware of how unfair things were. I had a sort of visceral feminism and having brothers and lots of male cousins in my extended family, that, that um, helped shape my views of the unfairness of things. Now in 19, oh yeah, there was also the fact that when I reached puberty, I started to experience various acts of molestation by strange men, 
um, I mean, strangers, they were, they were strange, but they were also not known to me or not well. And that helped too. Um, and right, so then, make you into a feminist, although it's not another yeah. help into experience. Yeah. And then I bought the female eunuch very soon after it came out. It was about 1972. So again, I was about 15. And I would say that really turned me into a feminist, but not a very good one because oh, there's a story there. I was bunking off school um, and I was sitting in a local cafe reading the female eunuch when a local shopkeeper came in and sat at my table to have his lunch. Um, we knew each other and he was on first name terms with my mom. In fact, he had a little local chemist shop that we used. And he was interested in my book and he asked me to lend him the female unit when I'd finished. So I lent it to him. And when I went to get it back from him, I went into his little shop and he said to thank me, he'd like me to choose a lipstick or two, which felt a bit awkward. Very feminist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was uncomfortable. Had you read the book, you aren't <laughs> He was, um, yeah, he was very, he was kind of creepy and I was extremely, extremely shy. I wasn't equipped to deal with these kind of approaches from men at all. I didn't know how to handle them. I never told my parents about them because I was so guilty and ashamed at letting them happen. You think you blame yourself. He gives me, he gives me the book back and then snogs me, basically. And I, uh, yeah, it was horrible. And of course, I never went back into that shop ever again and uh, never looked him in the eye. I did hear that he got beat up a couple of years later when he tried it on some tough bloke's girlfriend. <laughs> so he obviously made a habit of this thing. But. Charming. Yeah, but not often you get that over feminism, is it? But, um, mm. Mm. So you were very supportive to me when I was um, subjected to uh, a trumped up complaint from Humanists UK after I was in the London Pride protest against lesbian erasure and you kindly came to a disciplinary meeting to support me. Mm. You both noticed the gender divide in there. The fake complaints have been trumped up by the gay men at the top of Humanists UK saying that I would do this and I would do that. Not that I actually had done anything, but they said that I would refuse to take a trans person's funeral. I would misgender them in their funeral. None of which, of course, I would ever yes. do. Um, the, the two guys at the top, Andrew Copson and Richie Thompson, had um, taken fright at a, a, a pylon on Twitter and decided they would meet, they would like to um, pretend there'd been a complaint against me when there hadn't. And yet when I submitted lots of evidence saying what the reality of this issue was and saying where is that, where, where have I ever expressed any hate, where have I ever been rude to a trans person, um, the complaint was handed down to the feet, the next layer in the organisation, entirely female, to handle. And it's a nice illustration of how men get the handmaids working for them. Mm. Um, I was wondering, do you know many other people in Humanists UK who've left over this issue? I know I, I decided I wanted nothing more to do with them. The, the scales have fallen from my eyes. Mm. This is starting to be like the Labour Party it used to be full of left-leaning women, but there's now hardly any left. Yeah. Yeah, I've, learned, I've met a few, certainly, but I'm also aware of people joining for this reason. So it's, although I would have said that the bulk of the older, long-standing membership would have been mostly pretty sound, um, I think it's been infiltrated with lots of new, young, woke people now. Um, so it's um, catering to them. We see everywhere else. Mm. Being, you know, you deliberately get people to join in. Like I know this happened with the Mary Wollstonecraft statue group in Downing Newington Green. Right. Like, we'll come and help. Lots of new blood, lots of new people to help with the project. And of course, they magically change the nature of it um, into a, a men's rights um, agenda. So you know, that, that's discouraging. But I recently heard you give a talk to a Humanist UK group over the Zoom about transgenderism. And you clearly had peak trans nearly all of them. Mm. Most of them seem to be on side. Is this because they're thoughtful people who've actually looked at the science and recognised that there is a huge lack of evidence supporting the trans rights position? Or I don't know. Um, I, th I think it's very easy to peak trans people, sorry, <laughs> to peak trans people um, if 
they have an open mind. And, and I think those people did have, they hadn't come with too many preconceptions apart from that one person. Um, and if, and do you tell the truth? I mean, we were, we were at another one a year previously, weren't we? And it was the same thing happened. Um, people didn't necessarily know what was going on, but they had an open mind and all you had to do was show them the evidence and they came away quite shocked and very much in agreement um, that this was not a good thing that was happening. So, um, whereas in the case of the one dissenter that was there, I think she sort of confirmed what I've always suspected to be true, especially of women, um, which is that they have a, f a nice friend who, one or two friends who are trans. Right. There. I, I know Anna, who's there, there in the chat, will be laughing at this. And when I first met Anna and I was talking about this issue, she said, oh yeah, but I've got a trans friend. And it mm. always comes up. Having a friend is a, an excuse to switch off your brain, isn't it? I mean, I've got mm. an alcoholic friend. She's lovely, we get on really well. Um, some people in this group have met her, but it doesn't mean I think being an alcoholic is a good idea. It means it's not my job to judge her alive. Yeah. You can, you they, can criticize that someone's an aspect of someone's behavior privately to yourself, and you know, you don't follow the example of all of your friends, do you? You don't think, oh, she drinks too much, so I'll drink too much as well. No. It, it, it just doesn't, doesn't matter. Switch off your brain and suspend judgment doesn't matter how deeply you keep trying to impress on them that we're talking about an ideology here. Not all of those who promote this ideology are trans themselves. It's, there's been widespread institutional capture, policy capture. Look at all our MPs of every bloody party. There's no party we can vote for now, except maybe the DUP or something. Um, yeah, and it's in every organization, um, but you just have to point out the flaws and the harm it's doing, and they point blank refuse to believe it, and that's pretty patronizing and condescending. And when they say something like, well, I think you should try and look at the other side. Oh, for God's that's sake, woman. <laughs> for years, yeah. Yeah, not think I haven't been totally immersed in this subject for four years now, and that's not as long as many other people have. Exactly. It is, um, it is, it was quite worrying, I thought, but, but I was impressed because this person came in late, didn't they? Until then, pretty much everyone was saying, well, yeah, it does sound terrible. Mm. Um, because of course it does. So when, why do you think that Humanists UK, who claim to be a science-based organisation, a human mm. rights organisation, so quickly drank the trans Kool-Aid? Is it the gay men at the top? Should we perhaps expect any of them to come out as trans? Um, well, I don't know too many of the people at the top well enough to hazard, I guess, on whether they'd come out as trans. I'd be surprised if Andrew Copson did. But what I think is very likely is that they will be trying hard to get token trans people working for the organisation, either as staff or trustees or patrons, because they think it will help their image to their target market now. In fact, it's already happened, come to think of it. Um, as for why the organisation drank the Kool-Aid, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I think there are a number of factors involved. And obviously, as a phenom phenomenon, it's not confined to the humanists. Cool. I had some involvement with the UK skeptic community for several years, and it seems that quite a large swathe of mostly youngish skeptics have fallen for this nonsense. And so many of them are scientifically well educated, even working as scientists. Uh, same goes for prominent members of the Green Party in particular, but the other parties as well. What the hell has happened to these people? Well, knowing the kind of people who are drawn to humanism and scepticism and progressive politics, obviously there's an overlap and many people are all three, and I've been one of them myself, mm. but of the previous generation. So knowing more what it was like to be a young woman in a previous era. Uh, I've had to box off the 
bitterness I now feel against people I see as traitors to all the values I thought we shared and dig deep into my capacity to empathize with people who see things very differently to me. Before I hit peak trans four years ago, there were times in my life when I have felt deeply compassionate to people who describe themselves as transgender, who dis describe a revulsion at what they are, their sex bodies, their fear and distress, at the gendered cultural expectations placed on them. Some people are really good at describing their unhappiness with their lot in life. Yes. And if you don't think too deeply about the implications of what they want and the impact it can have on other people, it's very easy to see supporting the normalization of transgenderism as a good cause. If you stick your fingers in your ears and shout, la, 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 um, every time someone points out a flaw or the potential harm or the, the actual harm that is happening. And if you stay in your woke little bubble and uh, only engage with people who agree with you and reinforce your opinion, then it's quite possible to bask in the warm glow of self-righteousness that comes in believing exactly. that it's an you easy, are easy on the right side of history. Person I am, yes, I, I, I support the poor trans people. I don't need to think, I don't need to look at anything. Mm. Mm. I'll be mm. a nice person. And many people put it like this, why can't you just be nice? Why can't you just be kind? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so never... Maybe being too charitable, but I think that they are coming from a good place and there are none so blind as those who will not see. Yes, I, I think it's, it's a shame that the debate is so polarised and so heated because people changing their minds generally doesn't take, take place in that kind of a context. So I think we just have to keep on chatting to people and you know, peak transing people wherever we go in a, in a calm way. Professor Alice Roberts, who's on TV all the time, she holds high office, high office at Humanists UK and she has got qualifications as a scientist and a historian. And yet she's famous for believing in gender ideology. Is, is it on the basis of clownfish? How do the clownfish come into it? Was she seduced by her success on television, do you think? They can change sex, can't they? Can they? Is that what it is? Clownfish can yes. change sex, so we must allow humans to change sex. Penguins, in the penguins, the males look after the babies, don't they? They sit on the nests. So maybe we should um, we could change human behaviour in that way too. I've always wanted to be a seahorse because the seahorse, the men have the babies. Maybe we could achieve that. So do we do we think that Alice Roberts knows the truth of all this, or is she just like likes having the television work? Uh, can't I don't know her personally. I'm not sure what's causing her to make such idiotic pronouncements. But what I can say um, based on my personal experience is that scientists are no more likely to be rational, to have good critical thinking skills or to have more personal integrity than yeah. anyone else on the planet. I mean, there are scientists who are young earth creationists and argue against evolution. I know of scientists who believe in homeopathy and all other quack therapies. And I know of scientists who pretend that men who claim to feel that they are women are indeed women. I don't know whether scientists like Alice, because there are quite a few of them, um, are in trying to incorporate this very unscientific ideology into their worldview because they genuinely think there is a way of shoehorning it in without undermining their integrity um, because it's the kind thing to do or because they live the fear of the consequences of being truthful, which is a sign of the dark time we live in, but either, either way, it doesn't reflect well on them. No, I think it's, it's going to be a horrible reckoning someday. Um, and I do wonder what form it will take. Here in the UK, we've had apparently considerable success in challenging gender ideology in the courts and elsewhere. Feminists elsewhere tell us that we in the UK are leading the world in this particular fight. Um, how do you think this mad but oh so profitable craze will end? Do you expect a bang or a whimper? Um, neither really. I, I, it's 
an ideological war on many fronts with many battles and some we win and some we lose. But with each battle, whether we win or lose, more and more people are becoming aware and coming out on our side. That's something I've definitely seen in the last um, four years since I've been involved. But it's a very gradual process. I think that <clears throat> organizations, businesses, institutions that can quietly drop it will do so. And I would expect Humanist UK to be among those who do. Places like the Home Office will convert most of their unisex toilets back to the ladies' rooms without fanfare. Um, people who don't even claim to be transgender will realise that telling people their pronouns in their emails or wearing badges makes them look like bellends, etc. But when an organisation has to be dragged to court just to uphold what is already the law, as the magnificent Nicola Williams and Fair Play for Women mm. did with the Office of National Statistics over the census guidance, um, and that ended up with the ONS being humiliated. Uh, that, that's not a lesson they'll forget in a hurry. That's a, a battle won. And I'd call Kira Bell's victory, excuse me, a croaky throat. Yeah. <coughs> a croaky throat. Um, I'd call Kira Bell's victory against the Tavistock is really part of an ongoing battle, even though there's already been a successful appeal by the child abuse enablers against part of that decision so that um, parents who are in favour of their children being prescribed um, puberty blockers will count for enough um, to be prescribed them um, and only those children whose parents don't approve will have to seek a court order. Yeah. Yes, so um, this is the parental consent argument, aren't they? They're, so they're getting around it. So even if the um, on their own, if you can't persuade your parents, you're gonna they're gonna have to go to court. You're gonna have to wait till you're hard. 16, and then it's a maybe. But if you if you, this is actually going to play into all the homophobic parents who are really yes the thought of having a, a little tomboy daughter or a little as they would see effeminate son. Yes, yes, we've so had that it's going to allow the most homophobic people um, who who want to transition their children to do so. There's certainly plenty of stories from the clinicians at the Tavistock that it's um, they come from homophobic families. They suffer from internalised homophobia yeah. themselves. Seems yeah. to be quite a big driving force with these kids. Um, and, but even if the Tavistock were to win their appeal, that that case has done so much to raise awareness and yes. get the truth out there, which is the most important thing initially in defending this and we will with this win this eventually we will yes i thought an interesting little um battle one happened the other day you're probably aware of this when amy otherwise known as ashton challoner who has had um such a checkered life whose father was um put away as a con con convicted pedophile for torturing a little girl and giving her electric shocks up in his loft while he was dressed as a as a baby wearing nappies um, he had brought up two children, I think. One of them decided he was a girl at an early age uh, that became Amy. Um, and, you know, we had the story of becoming, you know, a spokesperson for the, uh, was it the Greens and then the Lib Dems. And then they decided maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But back to what you were saying about organisations all wanting to have a token trans person. And it looked like Amy was that person. Mm. And we then went to work for Reddit in the US and, and uh, Amy's partner apparently um, is very outspoken about his paedophilia, and it came to pass that Reddit decided that um, this was this was becoming uh, intolerable in in um, Amy's employment, and Reddit has now ditched them. So I think some of the more unstable trans people will go from lovely token job to lovely token job, and then um, some of their behaviour will become better known because they're in the public eye more. And I, I suspect there'll be a lot of things like that. But we didn't realise they had this dreadful behavioural glitch. Um, we just thought they were one of the nice trans people. And I, I think that will it'll be very personalised, is my prediction. But it'll be interesting to see, time will tell. Um, 
But yes, Nick Williams did a wonderful job. And the ones, I think the ones that haven't maybe taken on the, if they've taken on a token trans person, they'll get rid of that and then they'll be able to sort of slide away from it. Uh, those that have um, stuck it very heavily in their um, procedures and so on will have to go through a humiliating um, deconstruction process. And I imagine a lot of HR consultants will make a lot of money out of them, just as they did on the way through when they were making their policies all pro trans. Yeah. Um, so as usual, the consultants will benefit. Um, an aspect that hasn't really been considered with the trans argument is the environmental impact. Uh, I was talking to a young woman the other day who said she couldn't quite decide whether to be a radical feminist or an eco-feminist. And I think we're all becoming more environmentally aware and trying to change our behaviours. What do you think could be the environmental impact of trans activism and transgenderism? Is the one? Well, it's not something I feel very qualified to say well, much about. Anyone, you know, <clears throat> we, um, <clears throat> we know that all over the world there have been rapidly increasing concentrations of oestrogen in soil and water and they pose serious threats to plants and fish and humans and other animals, wild and domestic, when they enter the food chain, they're linked to breast and prostate cancers. Uh, but having but said that... Are they also that, linked for um, fertility? There's a, there's a big drop in male fertility, isn't there? Yes, yeah. Um, but I wouldn't have thought the impact is going to be from transgenderism is going to it's going to be tiny surely compared to the impact by women taking the pill or being treated for menopause symptoms so it would be good to know more about this hear from somebody more knowledgeable on the subject than I am yeah I think it, I'm surprised well obviously because it's such a hot potato nobody is talking about it and people are talking about the effects of the fat phthalates is it? and, and uh, you know in, in uh, the estrogen levels going up and so on and there was an interesting article a few months ago about um cat flea treatments people yes. treat their cats yes. fleas every month whether they need it or not mm. and they were finding huge concentrates of nasty chemicals from cat flea treatments in the water mm. supply just because there are so many domestic pets and i thought given that there's been such a steep increase in the number of people taking these hormones. There's, there's got to be an environmental effect. And the fact that one of the teenagers get it, will get around the law and are getting around the law by ordering it online from another country. And we know we've got that lovely Dr. Helen Weberly, the gender GP, saying, you know, I'll send it to you from Spain. Just put the money in my account. If you want some testosterone, you can have it. Um, it's, it's got to be having an effect somewhere. And I think the environmentalists are maybe, I mean, I like the environmentalists, but are they actually looking at the full picture here? I think somebody needs to look into this. Um, so who do you think will recant first? Will it be the handmaids like Humanist UK or the big players like Stonewall and the Tavistock Jids? I can't see Stonewall ever recanting. Um, they're just... I th they'll, they'll perhaps be left as the only uh, group campaigning for trans rights. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't think the humanists will publicly recant. I think they'll drop it quietly, whereas I think the Tavistock will have no choice but to recant eventually, and they will blame, no doubt, successive governments with some justification for cuts in funding adolescent mental health services, which is where most of their patients should have been referred in the first place. Yes, if they'd had counsel and the fact that all these issues children are presenting with could have been dealt with in the normal straightforward way. Yes. Yeah. I think some of the impact will be blunted because a lot of the long term effects of taking these uh, sex hormones lead people to have a, a shorter life. Um, I was talking earlier about the, the East German athletes who were fed testosterone mm. um, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and they, they were told they had to take their vitamins. They were given no choice. They were given no information. And there was a Radio 4 program about one of them. She said, well, you know, an awful lot of the people I competed with at the Olympic level have died early um, from, you know, heart problems, all sorts of, of health problems. A lot of people are so ashamed of, of what was done to them that they, they internalised the shame and, and they've kept quiet about it. 
but actually, you know, it has very, very serious long-term effects on, on people's, you know, bone density and heart problems and so on. And it's sad to think that um, something that's so, such a shameful thing being done to people is likely to, to sort of die away quietly because many of the people who suffer from it may yeah. live very short lives. I hate to think that. Um, I'm just looking in the chat, there's some interesting points being made there. <laughs> Someone says Stonewall needs to be closed down. That will happen when over time they're constantly being criticised and organisations stop deferring to them. And I would add to that, when the LGB Alliance gets its charitable status, if it, if it does, maybe, maybe the uh, charity commission has been got at, um, and, and, you know, starts doing the job that Stonewall should have been doing all along. Um, now, what's this? The Paradox Institute does a super job explaining how the SRY gene on the short arm of the Y chromosome determines maleness no matter how many XXXs. Wow, now we're going in beyond the Xs and the Ys. So when you, people are looking further into the science, all, all end up thinking this is a load of bull bunking. Um, so they should. Right, I think we're coming to the end. I think we all seem to be boringly agreed here. Great that no trans activists have come in to annoy us. They've been on our YouTube channel saying ridiculous things, and I've blocked a few of them and got rid of them. Now, somebody said an interesting point about the environment. They say that um, one big consequence from transgenderism is that they encourage people to stop engaging in real life and thinking about our major problems like climate change and oppression. Once you go down the road of whatever you believe is true and your unicorn is a real unicorn, you actually take a step away from your relationship with the real facts of the real world, which are always more horrendous the more closely you engage with them. Um, so I think that's a very good point. Thank you for that one. Somebody says that the pill doesn't affect water. Animal agriculture runoff from animals injected with this from animals injected with hormones. Human impact is minimal. Well, that's good to know. There's a lot. There's a lot more. Maybe some of the more open-minded scientists could bend their heads to it and get give us some more information. But I just think it's an important question. If somebody can come back and say it's fine, there's no impact on the environment, then that'll be I'll, that'll make me very happy. But uh, I, I do think we should be having the conversation. So I think we're coming to the end of our webinar. Thank you all very much for being here and for joining in. We're not quite sure who we're going to have next time. We've got a number of feelers out, but we will be doing another webinar in a couple of weeks time and we'll let you know. If you are the maker of the mystery turf blanket on the wall behind me, please make yourself known to us as we would like to thank you. I'd like to thank you all for joining in with our webinar. Thank you very much, Maria, for coming thank along you. and answering the questions. And I will look forward to seeing you all again next time. Did we do well, my darling girls? Did we really do well? We grew you up to be straight and strong To do your best to know right from wrong But we grew you in this awful world A world that's hard and tough for girls And part of your strength was to take it To take it and make it okay but it's not okay, my darling girls, in this fucked up, muddled up, mixed up world.